Good afternoon. My name is Laura Black. Um, I'm a doctoral student in the Cultural Studies Department, and I would like to welcome you to the Cultural Studies Department's 25th anniversary series, sponsored by the Thornton F. Bradshaw Programs and Endowment Fund. To celebrate its 25th anniversary this year, the Cultural Studies Department at Claremont Graduate University is hosting a semester-long series of events titled The Features of Cultural Studies. This anniversary series follows a remarkable and transformative year, as collectively we have witnessed a pandemic, rising global inequality, the accelerating effects of climate change, and the collusion of hegemonic structures and the disenfranchisement of Black lives. We've also seen radical shift within the local and global structures brought about by the digital revolution, neoliberalism, and neoconservatism. In response, the Futures of Cultural Studies series aims to interrogate the state of the field, reassess its presumptions, and investigate its possible future directions under the theme of futurity and future publics. Interrogations of futurity have always been entwined with considerations and reconsiderations of the past, and this series asks how cultural studies can bring to bear its interdisciplinary engagements with a history and historiography onto a transformative and decolonial agenda. Every month throughout the series, cultural studies will host events centered around one of five subtopics. Today, our faculty panel will introduce their background and present one of these monthly topics. Then following all of the presentations, we will hold a Q&A session with the panel. You are invited to submit questions throughout the talks via the Q&A link at the bottom of the screen. Please welcome our panelists, Drs. Nadine Chan, Joshua Good, David Louise Brown, Daryl Moore, and Eva Wishi. Um, good afternoon. I'm, I'm Daryl Moore, a visiting associate professor in the department. And I should also say that I'm coordinating the teach out for uh, the philosophy department. So I've been, also been working with the remaining philosophy students. And I say that to say this, that I enter cultural studies through philosophy and it's been um, quite a ride for me and I've been uh, grateful for it uh, because I'm trying to think about philosophy and cultural studies together in some kind of conjunctive way. Um, I'm particularly interested in the off post question, what is culture? Um, it, it's both a very particular question and a general question. I'm gonna take my cue from Stuart Hall, who um, responded to this question often between um, 62 and his death in 2013. But the uh, definition that I like is um, experienced lived, experience interpreted, experience defined. And I try to take that definition seriously. And when I do um, within the field of cultural studies and thinking about the, that question philosophically, the concept and practice of culture is a um, theater of struggle, right? So if we, we can frame it as a theater of struggle, and a theater of negotiation. And there are two um, takeaways for me um, that have been useful for the, over the past four years. And the first is by continuously placing into question our tendency to naturalize the distance among proper and improper or dirty cultures or among normative cultures and those cultures that have been judged by whatever criteria as distant or different from those norms, the problem that arises, um, as I see it, is how myriad political, economic, and social forces converge to place us in relation to each other in ways that we embody as a given. The second takeaway is that cultural studies has enabled me, and I'm gonna sort of me and us, um, to think about culture as a form of planetary placement that yields experience. 
So the problem that arises from this takeaway is how placement, which is both temporal and spatial, conditions the possibilities of experience. And experience in the, the, the two meanings of the term, both um, short-term experience, I had an experience of walking my dog this morning, and a longer-term experience, the experience of being a philosopher over the course of the past 15, 15 years. Um, so these two takeaways, this stage theater of struggle and negotiation, for me yields a fecund tension. Namely, culture as a form of distance, both temporal and spatial, that affords us a kind of stability within hectic upsets and unpredictable discontinuities. So while this tension yields the problem of how we maintain a continuity or a stability of culture, of cultural identity, of individual identity, um, through time as history changes continuously, I'm moved by and interested in the problem of how we think about futurity given that, that tension. And just to, to, to restate it slightly differently, um, what cult reading and cultural studies, particularly those early texts of the British school, Hogarth, Williams, and Hall, they've got me to, to think about the, the need, the, the desire for stability in a world that is constantly changing and often changing with a, a, a force of violence that becomes untenable at moments. I and mean, I think 2020 um, constitutes uh, one of those moments. So stability within a pandemic within an election, within uh, protests, um, within ongoing uh, neoliberal uh, cultural constructs. Um, so how do we think about futurity in that context, right? This need for stability, even though we know that culture is continuously changing. And there are myriad ways of thinking about futurity or future time. Um, and both as a problem of thought, but also within the, the, the field of cultural studies. Um, at present, um, because of what I'm teaching, I'm teaching a seminar on Fanon and a seminar on critique, art as critique, whether we can think of art as a form of critique. Um, the problem of future time um, I'm thinking about it, particularly in the way that Fanon presents it. Um, for Fanon, the problem of future time is a question of how we attend to an unfolding present. Um, without going into uh, Fanon's text, I'll give you just uh, two examples from one um, um, year, 1959. So in 1959, um, Fanon published a book uh, whose French title is Year Five of the Revolution. It's translated into English as Studies in a Dying Colonialism. Um, but what I, my takeaway from the title of the text is that Fanon is trying to figure out um, what, among other things, what it means to be Algerian when the question of becoming Algerian is on the table, right? Under conditions of, of, of grotesque violence. The, the question of the future, of future time, is a question of the present. And the task of cultural studies is to um, investigate the empirical unfolding of the imagining of the present, the desire for the present, um, that 
includes a responsibility to the future. Um, this is clearly demonstrated in all five of the essays, but the, the second example is the title of chapter one. The title comes to us, English speakers, as Algeria Unveiled. The French title is Algeria Unveils Herself, the herself being Algeria and the Algeria to come and Algerian women and the Algerian women to come. Um, but what I'm interested in is the process. So future time is a process that is unfolding in the present. And so it forces us to think about those two temporal, temporal uh, constructs conjunctively. And the second um, important takeaway from Fanon is how he contextualizes agency. So agency is what we do in the now, our experience in the now, but it, it really takes seriously um, the, the, um, the creative, the imaginary, the artistic, the desire, desirous, like what do we want now for the, the future? And, um, and I'm stressing this because it's different, it's, it's oddly secular. It's not um, futurity in the messianic or the religious sense, but it is, it's a futurity that's rooted in a process of the unfolding, a gentle action in the present. Uh, in the beginning of uh, chapter four of Wretched of the Earth, which is uh, another 1959 text, a lecture, he says that each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission or it will betray itself. So I'm also thinking that future time is about a certain kind of ethical responsibility to the present. So the provocation for cultural studies um, as a field and the way that it does its practice is about a responsibility to the empirical present, which keeps an eye on what we imagine um, the world to be, what we would like it to be, and how economic, social, and political forces position our imaginations and our desires in relation to um, an impossibility. And so it's as uh, Baldwin um, said in 63, it's about imagining and bringing the impossible into um, reality. And that's a, the, a, a futurity that is in the Fanonian sense revolutionary, but in the cultural studies sense, it's also institutional. And the other problem of cultural studies is thinking that revolutionary sense of futurity together with an institutional sense of futurity, which is by definition um, conservative and non-revolutionary. Great, I guess it's my turn. Um, it, it, Laura, is there a way I can share my screen or, um, or I'm a little nervous about doing so because I'll, I'll probably screw it up. But. You should be able to share. Am I, am I co-host? Let's see, what do I do? Um. <laughs> You're gonna, at the bottom of the screen, you should see uh, a green button, yeah. Okay, so let's see, let's see if this works. Oh, that's not fun. So will I be able to see, hmm, okay, let me see. <laughs> this is blowing my mind here. So if I, let's see, maybe I'll just go without, it's making me nervous, but I, I have a beautiful screen to share, but, but 
I'm afraid to share it. Uh, so let me just, I'll just jump into my talk. I, um, I, I'm going to be operating in a different register. I love Daryl's uh, philosophical register. My register is going to be um, a kind of memoir of my time in cultural studies. I probably won't make it past my time in graduate school given um, the time constraints. If I can find my timer, I'll put that on. Um, so I, I've, I want to talk about my time in graduate school because that's um, what all of you I imagine in the audience are experiencing right now. I want to explain how I came to fall in love with cultural studies. Um, I've always aspired to do interdisciplinary work since my undergraduate days. I did my MA in comparative culture, which was a kind of ethnic studies program. And then I was really excited to enter the uh, PhD program in literature at UC Santa Cruz because it contained a program called the World Literature and Cultural Studies Program. So uh, in, um, in the early 1990s, um, cultural studies was in full swing at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and that was because there was something called the Center for Cultural Studies and the anthropologist James Clifford was at its helm. Clifford, um, who, who worked in the famed History of Consciousness program, brought in a constant stream of fascinating speakers, many of whom came all the way from England, including Ian Chambers, Paul Gilroy, and Stuart Hall. Other speakers included Judith Butler, Mike Davis, and Hortense Stillers. And I remember, I, I also remember attending lectures on contemporary social movements, like the Zapatista movement of Chiapas. These events were packed with professors and graduate students, um, and this made for a really vibrant intellectual scene on campus. Every time the Center for Cultural Studies published its newsletter announcing the year's slate of speakers, um, it, was, it was an event in itself and we all carried the newsletter with us. And back, back then there was something called paper, which we carried in our backpacks, but it was, it was very low tech back then. Um, so I loved cultural studies not only because the Center for Cultural Studies was what put Santa Cruz on the intellectual map, but it also offered an abundance of models for the kind of cultural materialist analysis that I hope to produce. So, um, so that was the glamorous part of cultural studies for me was the Center for Cultural Studies. The hard part was trying to read all of that stuff in courses within the World Literature and Cultural Studies program. So I took a course with Jose Saldiva um, who's a Chicano cultural theorist, um, and it was called Chicano Cultural Studies. Um, and I love that course because he counterposed um, Matthew Arnold's definition of culture as the best of which has been thought and known to Raymond Williams's analysis of culture as a whole way of life. And when life, as Daryl reminds us, is, is understood as immersed in struggle. We examined Marx, Gramsci, Frederick Jameson, James Clifford's The Predicament of Culture, as well as a host of uh, British Cultural Studies and Black British Cultural Studies texts, Raymond Williams, Stuart Hall, Paul Gilroy, Isaac Julien, alongside contemporary Chicano cultural studies. Um, and at times in his graduate seminars, Jose would talk about wrestling with writing sections of his own manuscript, um, which would later become his book, Border Map Matters, Remapping American Cultural Studies which came out in 1997. And another course that I took, um, which was something, the title had something to do with nationalism, re regionalism, and race. We read two books that were hot off the press in 1993. The first was Paul Gilroy's The Black Atlantic, um, which many of you know, Modernity and Double Consciousness. And this was a book that called attention to outer national cultural flows. And the other book was Eric Sundquist's To Wake the Nation's Race and the Making of American Literature. So I, I was understanding national languages and literatures and cultures always in conversation with a kind of broader diasporic, hemispheric and global analysis. We also, in, in that course, we also read um, Du Bois's The Souls of Black Folk, Benedict Anderson's Imagined Communities and Mary Louise's Louise Pratt's Imperial Eyes Travel Writing and Transculturation, which came out the previous year. Pratt's book was important because it put Latin America on the map of postcolonial studies. Um, so uh, 
you know, I also took courses in African American studies, Latin American studies. And the problem I now faced was how to bring all of this together, how to, how to write a dissertation that addressed race in a hemispheric frame and um, that tried to redress the relative absence of the Americas in post-colonialism. I was interested in that kind of inter-ethnic, intercultural and transnational analysis. So um, what came out <laughs> eventually was something called Waves of Decolonization Towards an Inner American Cultural Studies, which would later become my book. Um, and this was a book in which I tried to think about how writer activists developed narratives and theories of decolonization, which I defined as kind of full freedom and equality in the shadow of empire. They weren't, and these were writers who weren't simply interested in national liberation and the, the attainment of state power. They were interested in a broader cultural struggle. So I took my cue from Du Bois's The Problem of the Color Line in its world aspect. I tried to understand struggles for power in, in US, Mexico, and Cuba. And th the way that these writers were trying to theorize something called um, discourses of hemispheric citizenship in uh, you know, ways that they try to um, broaden conceptions of citizenship rights to redress their loss under the expanding US empire. So I don't have time to say anything else. I can't get to my, um, my two books, well, my forthcoming book, nor my book in progress, but um, I'll leave that for the Q&A. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Nadine Chan, Assistant Professor in Cultural Studies, and my work is rooted in film and media studies, um, post-colonial studies, and the environmental humanities. So for today, we were asked to kind of think about the concept of futures and futurity in relation to our research, and also with regard to the future of the field of cultural studies. So I'm going to try and <laughs> do all that in the next five or so minutes. And so I've been thinking about the question of futures and futurity in various ways recently, and they've been changing a lot over the past year. You know, if you remember, right, at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, there were terms such as unprecedented, uncertain, and unparalleled kind of being thrown around, kind of ad nauseum by, you know, governments and corporations and institutions to sort of mark out you know, that we're entering a new zone of crises that seeks to drastically kind of rearrange what we understand of the temporalities of like capital labor and life. Um, my recent article in the Journal of Environmental Media talks about sort of these, uh, the, sort of the, the pandemic's temporal relations with regard to, you know, the temporal dissonances brought about by capitalist modernity. You know, these moments of fracturing distal temporalities that references increasingly divergent and unequal zones of work and life, which bring us toward very different and distal futures. And I kind of talk about this through sort of, you know, thinking through digital inequality and the techno caste system, for instance, in our rush toward expanding digital spheres of capitalism, you know, who gets to work from home and who does not, questions of data mining and so forth. But in that piece, you know, the point of it was to really think about how this discourse of uncertainty is an extension of long crises of capitalism where privilege, right, in an area of uncertain futures really means sort of the luxury of resilience and free future proofing while we kind of export risk to the exploitable. But you know, you know, after writing that piece and then kind of thinking further back about my other work on colonial cinema and my future work on, on um, visualizing the Anthropocene, this question of unequal futures and uncertain futurities uh, occurs to me as a concept that is a lot more wide reaching and long standing than I you know, previously would have thought about it. You know, if we, if we think that the precarity of, you know, 2020 of these recent times are exceptional, it is because we have had the privilege of occupying such a position, right? I mean, the colonized, the indigenous, the subaltern, however you define it, you know, the non-human have always already been living through extended states of exception, of crises, of foreclosed and uncertain futures. And so what I've been, you know, thinking about recently, and hopefully we get to talk about through this, this series, is if one can sort of trace a genealogy of thought on the question of, you know, imagining possible futures and questions of futurity through the colonial, the post-colonial and the ecological and these sort of various forms of, you know, of precarity. Um, so my first 
book project, which I'm currently kind of working on, is titled A Cinema Under the Palms, Colonial World, Make World Making in an Unruly Medium. And it draws a lot of its thinking from post-colonial and, and, and empire studies, which as a field, you know, has been very long invested in questions of historicity and temporality. You know, you have scholars like Chakrabarty and various others who have kind of critiqued sort of this, this notion of historicism of Europe's capitalist modernity, the idea that societies presumably move from the pre-capitalist to the capitalist stage as if from some sort of sort of linear progression um, from past to future. And so with my first book project, right, um, part of it is about kind of making this defini definitive connection um, as well as, as, as exposing, you know, moments of absolute rupture between colonial thought and the ontology of cinema um, through looking at, you know, um, instructional and documentary films in Southeast Asia, British Malaya in the first half of the 20th century. And as it pertains to, you know, the, the question of futures, temporality and futurity, one of the chapters in that book is about thinking about how, you know, the cinematic time of the colonial documentary produces linear, stadial, and temporal logics of modernity, but also disrupts it. You know, I'm, I'm quoting Ping Chia here, who, who says, you know, quote, the hierarchical order and control of the world as we know it is based on technologies of temporal calculation, end quote. So in that chapter, I'm really interested in how colonial so-called temporal calculations are rendered spatial and representational through the cinema. But at the same time, in that chapter, I'm also kind of interested in thinking about how there exists certain temporal asynchronicities within the medium of cinema that lends itself toward counter-colonial energies, which really kind of disrupt this formation of, of colonial time. You know, so for example, you know, there were tensions within this, these films that revealed how um, so-called colonized were imagining um, temporalities and alternative futures that kind of diverged dramatically from colonial scripts. So, you know, there's been a lot of work thinking about post-colonial historiography in, in post-colonial studies. And one of the aims of, of this um, series um, on the future of, of cultural studies is to think about how we might build conversations towards questions of post-colonial futurity. And I'm finding a lot of, of these conversations about, about questions of futures and futurity really kind of coming out of the environmental humanities and, and the ecological in ways that kind of speak back also to um, questions of, of colonial exploitation, plunder, and so forth. Um, so much about the questions of our ecological futures has to do, you know, in, in in scholarship at the moment with ontological questions of temporalities, time scales, and how simply how hard it is to imagine the futures. Um, for example, you know, in, in um, environmental media studies scholarship, there's been a lot of talk about how we fail to comprehend the slow violence of ecological degradation and so the sort of extensive time scales, geological time scales of planetary dyings amid sort of the quick attention spans of turbo capitalism and the kind of, you know, um, ruptures, um, capitalist ruptures that I was talking about earlier. And, you know, so, so the, the media forms that we love so much, right, are, are kind of really limited in their ability to kind of capture climate complexities to capture invisible ecological violences, and nor can they in a certain way help us to envision planetary futures. Moreover, you know, the question of what the planetary future holds, you know, what is hypothesis, what is likelihood, what is risk, what is eventuality, these are all questions about futurity in the face of, of uncertain and unequally born sort of uh, climatic impacts. Um, there is a politics to such questions, right? Um, discourses of what is and what is not acceptable risk is really kind of weighted against who, who bears those risks. You know, the, glo the global poor, the, the formerly and presently colonized people of color and so on. So these are calculations and models that render risk and eventuality for, for many, but, but not others. So for instance, there's been you know, quite a, an amount of recent scholarship that has been talking about how cal calculations of predictable futures or risk 
um, for example, you know, we were talking about sea level flooding or, you know, the likelihood of, of nuclear dumping kind of contaminating the water and, and the land of surrounding terrains, how these have kind of long histories in colonial and Cold War environmental racisms. So just very quickly, you know, I'm, I'm starting a second book project, um, which is in very early stages, which is, you know, which thinks about the archival how the archival impulses of, of photography and the knowledge making project of data imaging, you know, how, how our act of witnessing the Anthropocene or the Capitolocene via kind of uh, visual imaging systems is less about archiving the knowable than it is about me making meaning out of loss and out of potentially precarious and foreclosed futures. Um, I think about what it means to work through media's counter knowledge, what it means to witness under conditions where our visual reference are already extinct or degraded or forever displaced. And out of that, how do we imagine unequal and sort of distal futures? So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to kind of look at, you know, a variety of both indexical media, so film and photography, but also computational and data driven forms of um, information visualization and data modeling, such as thermal heat mapping, meteorological model simulations. And it's interesting because while the job of, you know, um, data modeling and visualization is to distill these very complex histories and the impossible, you know, the hard to predict futures via mathematical probabilities into simple kind of linear and complete forms. What I'm interested in is thinking about how there the various frictions within these, these you know, systems of visual uh, representation actually kind of put up challenges in how we hermeneutically comprehend, you know, um, environmental futures, obscured as they are within, as I mentioned, zones of invisibility, invisible violences, and so forth. So to sum up, in March, we are inviting two speakers for a mini panel slash roundtable to discuss the topic of environmental and ecological futures, how questions of planetary futurity intersect with formations of colonialism, capitalism, questions of temporality, and with a particular interest in visual culture, right? We want to be thinking about how do we imagine, you know, um, unimaginable planetary futures amid lost reference, extinctions, foreclosed possibility, uh, inequality, and unequal access to future thinking. How can we rethink our temporal logics to account for alternative planetary kinships and indigenous cosmologies? Where can we find the frameworks to imagine alternative futures to that of the historicisms of colonial capitalist modernity and its you know, unfolding of planetary extinction and plunder? So I hope you will join us for this very timely event. Thank you. Great. I, th I think I'm next. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to try to do this fairly quickly. It's easy to do an intellectual biography pretty quickly, but a biography, it takes a long time. I was born. No. Uh, so my intellectual biography and sort of how it connects to the museum studies components of, of the Futurity Conference or series of events. Um, you know, I came to cultural studies actually from a kind of intellectual disposition that you know, was born of the concessions that one makes when one's in grad school and one wants to keep uh, food on the table. I worked at the Getty uh, uh, Research Institute when I was in graduate school, uh, sort of happenstance, I ended up getting a, a position up there that ultimately after over the course of a couple of years transformed into a kind of curatorial assistantship working with some curators up there I did not have museum experience. I was not particularly drawn to the museum, but what drew me to the work that I was doing at the time, I, you know, I was a European historian working really in what would we call intellectual history, but I was an oddball in intellectual history and in that I was interested in ideas and as they, how they moved through time, but I was really more interested in when ideas have teeth, how one applies, what motivates sort of social policies that are guided by these sort of larger ideas. Well, how did that connect to the museum? I started working with this curator and who was working on an exhibition on um, Mexican imperial photography or photography for during the Mexican empire. And he was a highfalutin guy with lots of theory and he was struggling to figure out a way to make the photographic exhibition that he wanted to create 
accessible to an audience and accessible to the audience that was walking into the Getty. And so that was, was my job. I had to kind of be the translator. And that, that work was really fascinating for me because it, again, it was about transforming ideas into uh, a different kind of language, a different kind of uh, really applying ideas, right? Getting the audience to understand what the curator's vision was through the wall text, the didactics, through the catalog that uh, we ended up producing. And that kind of aligned with the with the work that I was doing. I was working on race uh, in uh, late 19th and early 20th century in, in Europe, in particular in Spain. But what really made my initial work sort of captivating for me was the idea that you had all of these figures, politicians, cultural uh, poets, writers, um, uh, social scientists, people working in government, uh, working with these sort of ideas about race, but then trying to apply them and coming up with social uh, and political policies rooted in these complicated ideas of, of race. And so this idea of thinking about how ideas get translated, how they get implotted, how they get expressed out into the world and then do damage or at least do work in the world uh, was kind of, you know, help, you know, sort of align that kind of, it, it allowed me to have a kind of intellectual disposition that worked in the museum work, but also worked in my own uh, scholarly work. Flash forward to uh, 1925 and I got a job at CGU. Um, uh, uh, Professor Oishi was on my hiring committee and I remember being at, I remember saying in that interview, uh, could you do anything, could you teach anything in museum studies? And I hadn't thought about museum studies. In fact, I didn't even fully understand what that field was, especially in its unique version as expressed at, at CGU, the sort of um, more theoretically driven uh, questions about what is a museum, what is an institution, what is an apparatus of power of which the museum or the university uh, or, uh, or any other institutional apparatus represents. How is the museum itself a controlling interest? How does it express and, and, and dominate uh, it, uh, the population? I didn't really know that any, any of that literature existed, though I had read it sort of indirectly um, over time. And so during that interview, I said, oh, I could teach a museum studies course. And I remember Professor Oishi asked me, well, how would you teach it? And I said, oh, I, huh, that's a good question. Let me think about it. So um, anyway, flash forward. Uh, to the, the work that we've been doing in museum studies at CGU is exactly kind of at this nexus, this moment where we think about the ideas, the content of the museum, the idea of a museum as a dispenser of knowledge or as a, as a, as a site of authority and expertise, but also conscious and, and, and how it's done practically, but also consciously who is the audience? Why do people go to it? Why does it remain as a kind of social political apparatus as a site of knowledge? And so that question, those kinds of theoretical questions still uh, sort of underlie the approach that, I, that we bring to the museum studies courses here at CGU. They are sort of rooted in that kind of old intellectual historical approach uh, that that drove my initial research and that sort of is expressed in my subsequent research projects, which I can talk about uh, uh, during the Q&A. Um, and that will undergird the, the discussions that we're gonna have uh, in, in, the, in the conference. And just very quickly, what we're doing in the conference, to me is a kind of perfect expression of what museum studies at CGU is in that you know, I've been attending umpty ump number of panels about the future of the museum in the COVID world. And all of those questions are very practical. Where's, is there gonna be an audience and how do we go digital? But no one's real, and what's, what's been frustrating me in those panels and those conversations is no one's asking the questions about what really is not gonna change. Uh, about in the in, in in the sort of threats to the future of the museum, changing notions of what an audience is, changing notions of what expertise is, changing notions of what the authority that's in plotted in the museum site uh, uh, is undergoing, and sort of what the relationship is between the museum and its audience. Those are big theoretical, uh, intellectual questions, and ones that I think we're going to really uh, probe in our uh, in our. Uh, events in the spring. So try to do that quickly. Uh, Professor Oishi, all yours. 
All right, thank you. I, I, everyone, of course, after you listen to everyone else's, you wish that you had written a, a completely different um, different presentation. And I realized that I, everything that I, this, the biography that I've written doesn't actually include any mention of my current research. So I'm happy to talk about that afterwards as well. Um, but I will begin this intellectual biography somewhat arbitrarily in graduate school when I was getting a degree in literature at Rutgers University. Uh, there are several ways to tell this story, including my move away from literature towards film and media studies. But for now, I will briefly sketch out my journey from literature to cultural studies, and then to the final theme of our anniversary series, mapping the path by way of a few critical junctures. The first was my encounter in a 20th century poetry class with this bridge called My Back, Writings by Radical Women of Color. First published in 1981 and edited by Sheree Moraga and Gloria Anzaldúa, this book introduced me to the field that was just emerging, but that would, in the intervening decades, become known as women of color feminism. It was radical in its centering of the experiences of women of color, or as they alternately call themselves, third world women. It was radical in its unapologetic centering of lesbian of color perspectives and in its multi-ethnic inclusion of work by Black, Asian American, Latina, and Native women. And finally, it was radical in its inclusion of poetry, memoir, manifesto, and theory into one volume. In its very form of collage, assemblage, a whole greater than the sum of its parts, it enacted its politics and its theory. I was still a few years away from being introduced to the language of intersectionality, but this was intersectional theory in action. For about a year, almost every paper I wrote for my grad seminars was on this bridge called my back, as I tried to get to the heart of what was so compelling about it for me, both politically and methodologically, or to be more precise about the ways in which affect as political formation, autobiography as theory, and community as aesthetic form could speak to and through one another. I obsessively disassembled it like an antique timepiece trying to get to the mystery of what I would later come to understand was also at the heart of questions of disciplinarity, the connection between what we set as our objects of analysis, how we approach those objects, and what knowledge we produce through that engagement. The second critical juncture was also serendipitous. I had chosen Rutgers because of its reputation for gender studies scholarship, but I did not know that it was one of the major academic homes of US cultural studies. It housed Social Texts, the premier cultural studies academic journal, as well as the Center for Critical Analysis of the Contemporary Culture, now called Center for, Criti for Cultural Analysis, the name and homage to Birmingham's Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies. I was fortunate to receive a pre-doctoral fellowship at the CCACC, which involved participation in weekly seminars with faculty visiting postdoctoral fellows from the humanities and sciences, and other graduate students from departments across the university who shared their work around a common annual theme. This experience introduced me to the idea of interdisciplinarity as method. The idea that instead of simply entering a field as a journeyman and being trained in the methods in which your mentor and your mentor's mentor had been trained, you begin with a problem or set of questions and you assemble the tools and approaches you need in response. And as part of that endeavor, you understand yourself to be always part of a larger team of collaborators and your contribution to be only a small piece of the work in what Stuart Hall has called the necessary modesty of cultural studies as an intellectual project. The final theme of our series is cultural studies for the future, which looks at new methods in the field. In particular, we have chosen to highlight digital humanities and public humanities which utilize new and old technologies to map, imagine, and distribute histories, forms of knowledge, and forms of community. These projects speak to and enact new publics, but also reimagine private spaces and forms of privacy. Which brings me to the latest juncture in my intellectual journey, which is the COVID-19 pandemic and distance learning. Here, I want to pay tribute to the work of FemTechNet, an international network of feminist scholars, artists, organizers, and hacktivists who share and distribute resources and knowledge around technology and innovation. When the pandemic hit, I turned to them for guidance on how to think about the fact 
that I was now stuck at home trying to teach students who were also stuck at home. They have a number of principles that I adopted and I'll quote just a few of them here. One, they call it distance learning, but it can be intimate, horizontal, distributed, online, in real life learning. Two, migrating a class into domestic space changes all interactions. Three, consider what co-presence means in any learning situation and how we relate to each other newly through screens and with various technologies. And four, foster skepticism and techno-solutionism, sorry, foster skepticism about techno-solutionism and the visibility of corporations who are promising a new normal. Suddenly in March, the veil of professional distance that masks and supports academic hierarchies was torn away. I got to see my students' bedrooms, their pets and their kids, and they saw mine. We could not pretend anymore that our realities began and ended in the classroom. We were freezing and stuttering, disappearing and being interrupted, all while managing the stress and strain of sick family members, job insecurity, environmental threats, and financial strain. We came to rely on our technology, even as its unreliability exposed the inequities and dissymmetries of the world outside the screen. It was one more tearing down of academic walls, a turning inside out of the divide between public and private, a reminder of the fundamental intimacy of public facing political work. And I end by positing that our academic lives and our charge will never be the same after. It is here that the tools of cultural studies past responsiveness, flexibility, cross-disciplinary collaboration must merge with the tools of cultural studies future, specifically its feminist future, to produce work that embraces the technological possibilities of new networked publics, but never forgets that revolution can also occur in private with a tool as simple and as powerful as a book of poetry. Thank you. So we have six minutes. Um, we welcome some questions. Um, if you'd like to post them to the Q&A for the panel. And if not, we can certainly ask questions of each other. I'm wondering if anyone, we didn't share each share our talks with each other before um, before this. So I'm wondering if anyone um, has any questions for each other about. I, it was really interesting to to see some of the um, crossovers and and places where we converged and diverged. And I don't know if anyone had thoughts on that. Actually, Dr. Rishi, if you don't mind, um, there was a question for people that came in late. If you could just briefly kind of um, summarize what the spring conference is going to be as well. Again. Does anyone want to take that? Oh, I can do it. Um, so this is. Um, the, this is the Cultural Studies 25th anniversary that we're celebrating this year, the department's anniversary. And um, to do so, we wanted to try to take this opportunity to reflect on what cultural studies is, how we came to it, how we, what we understand it to be, how we were trained in it, how we teach it now and how we practice it now, but also where we see it going and what we understand to be the future of not only the department, but the field in general. And so we, uh, in, in a, um, through conversation, we identified five themes that we wanted to highlight. Um, and we will be inviting speakers and panels, um, organizing events around those five themes throughout the spring semester. So um, some of those are confirmed, some of those are still waiting to be confirmed. So we will be releasing the program hopefully by the end of the semester. So please stay tuned. And maybe I could just like um, 
review those five themes. So the first is imagining futurity with a focus on Afrofuturism. The second is on future publics, uh, strategies for an abolitionist future. The third is um, on ecological futures. The fourth is on future museum and museum futures, in other words, decolonizing the museum. And our final theme has to do with cultural studies for the future, particularly digital and public humanities. So those are five kind of broad areas that we're gonna be thinking through in the spring conference. Great, uh, thank you, Dr. Chan. And there's another question, um, if the conference will be open to alumni as well. I assume the conference is going to be open to the public, isn't it? And certainly open to anyone in the CGU community, including alums. But I imagine, and with the separate events, that I'm sure they will be advertised widely and, and and even open to the public. But I, but I might be speaking out of school. We haven't thought that one through. But certainly, if you have CGU somewhere in your past or present or your future, you're welcome to the conference. And we're absolutely hoping to create opportunities for our alumni to get together and 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 come back virtually, but also to to collect and and share what they've been doing. There is also a an anonymous request um, to consider doing a, some sort of graduate student conference as part of the anniversary. So that might be something to look at. Nadine, do you want to talk a little bit about the workshop series? Yeah, so in conjunction with the, the conference, we're starting a workshop series in the spring uh, where we'll be, you know, the, the plan is to have this as an ongoing part of the intellectual life of, of cultural studies and school of arts and humanities. So to have, you know, maybe eight events, eight work, eight to 10 workshops a year, where we'll be inviting both faculty as well as current graduate students or, you know, alumni who are currently working on revising their books to workshop a chapter or an article in progress that's sort of in the advanced late stage of writing. And so the idea of this workshop is that, you know, we have pre-circulated papers of whatever, you know, whoever's workshopping their stuff, we get a respondent to respond to them. And then we also sort of as a community read the work and, you know, offer feedback, discussions, questions um, to whoever's presenting their work. So, you know, our hope is, you know, for this event to not only kind of showcase the work of, of faculty as and, and our graduate students, but also to kind of build intellectual conversation um, at really the cutting edge of, of, of writing and, and research. So we hope that will kind of, you know, kind of um, be something that will, you know, get us all together and reading each other's work and kind of, you know, building these bridges. Eve, there was someone in the Q&A uh, who asked about FemTechNet, um, where to find it um, and how it's spelled, that sort of thing. Can you put that in the chat maybe? Actually, I think I, I put the um, URL in there, but please correct me if oh, I'm not. Yeah. Can you put it in the chat as well, Laura, for all of us? I don't, I don't see it in my chat. Yes, that's, that's the correct one, Laura, thanks. FemTechNet, and it's a, it's a huge resource. I mean, there's a ton of stuff. They did a, um, a MOOC, they did, um, they have a lot of uh, references. It's, it's extremely useful. So I know it is one o'clock, but there is a question for Dr. Moore, if there's time for that. Um, so Pilar, a friend, uh, asking if we consider Butler's question of what is the political significance of assembling as bodies, stopping traffic or claiming attention, or moving not as stray and separated individuals, but as a moving social, or but excuse me, but as a social movement of some kind. And you mentioned that culture for you was a theater of struggle and ne negotiation. So what can the body do? And which bodies have mobility and institutional access? Are we finally blurring the lines of actor and spectator and becoming emancipated? How do you reimagine this cultural theater? A lot, Pilar. Um, I, I agree 
with the um, quote from Butler, the, the takeaway from um, the, the quote and the takeaway from the way that, that you've been thinking about the bodies and that quote from Spinoza is it encourages us to think about the body in multiple ways, both as a singular organic um, entity, the way that we speak about it in, in conversation, but also in the multiple ways in which that body assembles with other bodies, both organic and, and, and inorganic. The question that you, um, that I, the, what I want to pull out that I think is, is, is really interesting is um, thinking about bodies in relation to social movements. And I think that there are myriad ways um, that we can imagine um, future assemblages that can form into social movements. But I, the way that I would think about it is not to try to predict it, but to create the space for um, accidental coming together is coming together is that we cannot predict um, and that our work is is about um, both doing historical work right on um, how to understand social movements that have taken place in the past whether or not there have been events that have happened in the past that we didn't interpret as political social movements that we might interpret in that way um, and paying really close attention to um, our unfolding present. So as I said in, in um, my uh, um, remarks, I'm very much interested in how we are able to see, hear, and feel the kinds of, of adaptations that bodies are doing in response to the pressures that are placed upon them, um, the precarities under which they are, are living. So there's a certain kind of, of bodily maneuver, bodily adjustment that we don't see, we haven't been trained to see. And so I'm interested in how to make those um, haptic, how to make them visible um, um, to us. Um, but I don't, I don't know that there was a, a question in, in um, your question, Pilar, except for that last part. And to answer that directly, I don't, I have trouble, um, imagining in a predictive way um, social bodied movements in, the, in the, the future. But what I'm more interested in doing is thinking about the spaces which in, within which bodies can come together um, that will produce social movements, but that happens unpredictably and by accident. So it's about how do we, in this present moment, prepare ourselves for a possibility that we actually couldn't imagine. Let me know what you're thinking, Pilar. Um, um, Laura, can Pilar respond um, verbally? I don't believe so, but she can put it in the Q&A and I can okay. send it off to you. Well, we are over time. So um, I, I don't know if, if Pilar is responding, but maybe <laughs> <laughs> this could be a conversation that can be continued um, offline. It's hard because there's a firewall in this webinar format. Um, but I want to thank everyone for coming and joining us. Um, we have recorded this and we will are trying to figure out where, um, where this video will live. So it will hopefully be available um, to people who missed it or who would like to watch it again. Um, thank you for uh, thank you to Laura so much for uh, being our, our host and our moderator. 
and um, to my colleagues for sharing their their intellects and their and their stories and their work. And we hope that you all stay tuned for um, the schedule for the spring. It's going to be really exciting. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thanks.